Hey guys, I'm Tyler Lawn and Chief Analyst of Cabot Small Cap Confidential and Cabot Early Opportunities and I'm here with your Cabot Weekly Review. I'm recording this on Friday, April 1st uh, at around 11 o'clock. So market uh, is doing much better than it was a couple of weeks ago. We've had a little bit of a rally last two or three weeks, maybe a little bit soft this past week. Um, but again, big picture, much better than we were looking in uh, February and earlier in March. Having said that, end of the first quarter, we look at the year-to-date data. It has been the worst quarterly performance in two years. The year-to-date performance for the S&P 500 is down almost 5%, NASDAQ down 9%, and small caps down almost 6%. But again, better than we were doing, so sort of a win here. Um, macro concerns continue to be the issue, inflation, oil prices, war in Ukraine, and of course this inverted yield curve, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Very briefly on Tuesday, the yield curve, this is the 10 versus two year inverted. And that matters because what we hear in the news all the time is uh, inversions are horrible for small cap stocks and large cap stocks. Um, they have been one of the best predictors of coming recessions preceding 10 out of the last, 10, last 13 scenarios. Uh, but that said, the timing is not precise. It's not like you get a yield curve inversion and then bam, next quarter you're in recession. Um, we look at the timing, uh, so I put together this chart um, from the St. Louis Fed, which just shows uh, inversions. So when the blue line drops below that bold horizontal black line, that's the inversion. Uh, and then the shaded areas are recessions. So if you just pour over this for a second, you can see that inversions uh, then do clearly tend to lead to recessions. The one in 2019 was super brief, uh, lasted less than a month. Um, so we'll see what happens here with the one that just occurred on Tuesday, or if we have a deeper inversion, you know, in the weeks ahead, we, we just don't know. Um, but turning to the data, uh, which really tells a, a better story. So again, the data shows that stock performance following inversions has not been good dating back to say 1956. If you look at this, you might be worth just pausing the video so you can kind of figure out where um, where the data columns are. But you can see that in the last 11 inversions, large caps have been down by an average of 5.7%, while small caps have been down by an average of 6.8%. However, if we look at just the last six instances, so dating back to 1978, both small and large cap stocks have been up during um, the period between an inversion and when it came out of inversion. Uh, both asset classes were up by around 3%. And in only two of the last six instances were returns negative. In several cases, they were positive and, and double digit returns um, in two of them. So again, as always with data, there's all sorts of caveats. You have to kind of look at the, you know, all the influencing factors. Um, we have to look at GDP, uh, unemployment, what's going on in the macro environment leading up to an inversion and after. Uh, as we know right now, Fed policy has kept interest rates very low. That is changing. Um, market rates have gone up significantly in anticipation of Fed rate hikes continuing. Um, so that's having an impact on the yield curve. And then of course, uh, we have the Fed's balance sheet, which is the other big piece of the puzzle. If we turn to that quick chart here, you can see that we, uh, the balance sheet is at a record high, nearly 9 trillion. As they start to taper, um, that theoretically should have an upward impact on yields. So it's gonna impact the yield curve just another moving part. We're just gonna to have to see how all this comes together. Again, going back to this idea that uh, a yield curve inversion is really bad for stock price performance, because um, that's what we hear about in the news. It's just, it's not that simple. There's there's more to it. Um, and as I, as I showed you, sometimes the returns can be, can be quite attractive. It just a lot depends on also how long it takes for um, the yield curve to come out of inversion once it's gone in. So all of, all you know important things to keep an eye on. Right now, this inversion 
from Tuesday isn't something that's keeping me up at night. I'm really more concerned with um, what, how investors are going to react as we get deeper into the second quarter, maybe into the third quarter, as the Fed continues to hike, uh, and we see what happens with real rates uh, in the market, and also whether there is any of the desired Im impact on inflation, because um, that's kind of one of the big boogeymen out there in the market. So again, enough about that. Let's move on to individual stocks, because that's what we all like to talk about. I want to talk about healthcare. Um, go back to the S&P 500 here, but big picture. So healthcare offers some defensive growth, also some yield. It's supported by strong democratic demographics and pricing power. I think all of these things should be of interest to investors right now when things are a little bit dicey. Uh, we also have healthcare trading at a discount to the broad market. And there are a lot of names that have been punished as well as some stocks that are doing very well. Um, so you can kind of pick your spot on the risk versus reward curve and the momentum versus value curve. Uh, obviously you have a company like United Health, big healthcare provider, relatively defensive. That's on the relatively low risk end of the spectrum. Whereas at the other end you have small and mid cap biotech stocks and all sorts of options in between. In terms of what I think looks interesting right now, a couple of names will feature and then I'll throw a few more charts at you. Um, so we have Pfizer, company we all know relatively well, market cap of almost 290 billion. Stock is down a little bit over the last week, but definitely doing better than it was um, in February. So this is a story about a large biopharma company coming out of a growth trough um, related to a patent expiration of Larica, if I pronounce that right, uh, trying to refire growth with the cash from COVID related products and hopefully some M&A resulting from that cash. So just to put things in context, management put out guidance for 2022 revenue of around 100 billion. Of that, around 45% should come from core products. The rest should come from COVID related stuff, around 30% from the vaccine and around 23% from their new Paxlovid oral COVID-19 antiviral pill. Results from Paxlovid could be better. We'll see where things fall. A lot depends on contracts and timing and all of that. But just step back, you think about that 60 to 70 billion in COVID related revenue, huge amount of money. What's Pfizer gonna do with it? Well, one of the first things they've done, they recently acquired Arena Pharma. Uh, this was a holding in Cava Small Cap Confidential. Arena has a potential blockbuster compound in Atrazomod, has just done very well in two key studies. They have a lot more going on in the pipeline. It's just one example of, of something that Arena can do <clears throat> to put this money to work and kind of get growth going again. So that's Pfizer. I think it could be a significant story um, over the next five years. Moving on to a little bit of a smaller company here, we have Shockwave Medical, market cap of 7.6 billion. So this is a medical device company. They have a new solution to treat calcified cardiovascular disease disease. Management says the tech can treat the most complex types of anatomies while minimizing some of the complications associated with other types of procedures that have a history of leading to dissection and perforation and also have steeper learning curves. They say that the target market potential uh, for their technology is around 8.5 billion and revenue is surging right now on the back of an FDA approval for their coronary product in the U.S. In terms of the numbers, Revenue in the fourth quarter was up 271% to 84 million. Uh, and initial 22 revenue guidance calls for around 75% growth. Shockwave is also profitable, uh, which is something that's extremely attractive in a mid cap medical device company, especially these days. All right, quicker hits on the next companies. Uh, AbbVie, ticker, ticker symbol ABBV. We all know this company. Trend here is terrific. Yield uh, is around three and a half percent. Not going to get into the story here, but it looks like it could continue just based on on what they are doing. Another company that a little bit smaller uh, is Jazz Pharma, market cap of almost ten billion. Stock has come up nicely from the bottom, back above the fifty and two hundred day moving average line. Probably some resistance here around one hundred and sixty. 
Uh, the big picture story here is about new product revenue growth, and they also have a late stage pipeline uh, and some stuff in kind of the mid mid stages. Um, so those things could add could add to the revenue growth story uh, in the years ahead. We'll move over to some life science tools. Uh, both Danaher and Replogen are companies that I've talked about before. Both companies have bioprocessing solutions. They gained a lot of customers due to COVID, and I think that's increased the visibility of their bioprocessing um, capabilities, as well as helped them make some acquisitions. Uh, so both both of these stocks, you know, they're not they're not beaten down by any stretch of the imagination. But Danaher here, 13% off of its highs. Um, so there's a little bit of a pullback there. Replogen, deeper pullback, kind of because it went on this insane run uh, in July through September. Um, if you take that out, it's kind of just been going sideways. You can't just ignore, you know, four or five months of a chart, of course. But um, at any rate, there's Replogen, smaller company, around 10 billion market cap. And then last but not least is another device company. This is Dexcom somewhat larger, 52 billion market cap. So they have a continuous glucose monitoring system, probably somewhat familiar. I think Mike has featured Dexcom uh, a decent amount, but relevant here, the stock has come back above its 200 day moving average line. Didn't really pause at all at resistance around 510. Uh, we'll see if there's any follow through here, but again, you get into the story uh, and it looks like it should have some good growth um, and the stock could do well in the quarters ahead. All right, guys, that's it from me. Hope you have a nice weekend and nobody gets you too good uh, today on April Fool's Day. Take care. We'll see you later.